Boris Johnson lied. He lied to MPs, he lied to the people of this country, he lied to nurses, doctors, care workers, bus drivers, everyone who was putting their own lives at risk during the pandemic. Why does this matter, Mr Speaker? Because people sacrificed so much and they deserved a Prime Minister who values truth and honour, one who leads by example, and it turns out they didn't have one. As I read this report this morning, and I have, I thought of all those people, including constituents of mine, who couldn't say goodbye as loved ones lay dying because they stuck to the rules, because when they hear these headlines, they will be forced to relive their own hurt and anger. I thank the committee members for the thoughtful and considered work that they've carried out over a year under constant intimidation from the former Prime Minister and his friends. They did as we asked, diligently, and we should all be grateful. I am disappointed to hear that the attacks on them, a committee with a Conservative majority, a cross-party committee, properly constituted, those attacks continue today, led by Mr Johnson. His behaviour is shocking but not surprising. I was Shadow Leader of the House two years ago when he tried to rip up the rules to save his friend Patterson. Hundreds of Tory MPs voted with him I'm afraid to say, including the current Leader of the House. And as we don't know what the motion on Monday will say, I ask her now, can she assure us that there will be no such similar attempt? Will she confirm the Government will give the House the opportunity to approve and endorse the report in full? This all brings into question the validity of Johnson's resignation honours list and the Prime Minister's support for it. With a lawbreaker and a liar rewarding his cronies, will the leader call on the Prime Minister to show some leadership for once and cancel these dishonourable honours? So, on the Prime Minister's incredibly poor judgment, is he so out of touch that he thought it was right that taxpayers' hard earned money fund legal advice for Johnson's lies to the public? A shameful waste of money during a Tory cost of living crisis, especially. This was a mess of his making. Does the leader think this was a good use of public money? Will the Prime Minister now demand that Boris Johnson pays back every penny? Now, we will return to this on Monday in full when I will face the Right Honourable Lady again. But on to a related matter, Mr. Sp Mr. Ma Madam Deputy Speaker. A week really is a long time in politics, especially if you're the member, or is it the former member, for Mid Bedfordshire, because who knows? She's had a busy week. Apparently, barred from being a baroness, she then declared her departure, then threw a tantrum on Talk TV, seemingly resiled her resignation, and launched a one woman investigation into why she didn't get a peerage. This could now drag on for months, like the guest who outstays their welcome. When conversation has dried up, she said she's off home, she's taking forever to put on her coat, and you know what? She will stay for that last cup of tea after all. Is this really what people can expect from Tory MPs? So could the leader please clarify, is her colleague resigning or not? Does she agree that the good people of Mid-Bedfordshire actually deserve proper representation from their MP, as do also the people of Uxbridge and South Ryslip, Selby and Ainsley, and people up and down the country who cannot stomach a moment more of this Tory soap opera, with a Prime Minister too busy failing to get a grip on the sleaze and scandal engulfing his own party to focus on the cost of living, on crime, on NHS waiting lists, with so much to do and he can't even fill a full parliamentary day. What is the point of him? He is out of touch, out of ideas, unable to govern, he's breaking his promises, he's letting people down, and it's time he showed some actual leadership and let the people have their say and call a general election. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Leader of the House. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, first of all, can I associate myself with the remarks and tributes paid in this House to the victims of the Nottingham uh, attack and their brave 
families and friends, and also all those who perished uh, at uh, the Grenfell fire six years ago and those that loved them. Uh, this week, we also commemorate the liberation of the Falkland Islands, and uh, that is of particular importance to many of the families that it is my privilege to represent. Um, the Honourable Lady uh, raises the, uh, the issue of the hour, and I think it is worth reminding this House that the Privileges Committee is there to defend this House, our rights and our privileges. The committee uh, and the investigation that they carried out was set up unanimously by this House. We asked them to do this work. The membership of the committee was established again unanimously by this House, and as many members have pointed out, uh, it had a Conservative majority on it. I want to put on record my thanks to uh, the uh, committee, uh, and as my, uh, uh, I hear from a sedentary position, yes. Uh, members of that committee doing uh, their duty. Uh, my advice to all right honourable and honourable members is having had the committee carry out the work we asked them to do is to read the report, is to make their own judgments about it and uh, take the task that uh, is our privilege to do uh, seriously and uh, soberly. And members should use uh, their own judgment on that. I can confirm that the motion before us will be votable, it will be amendable, and it is House business, uh, and so I am expecting a free vote. And uh, I know also, because the Honourable Lady uh, uh, reminds us of a previous, uh, previous case too, these, these are difficult matters for the House. Uh, we have to look at the evidence, we have to look at the report, but we are talking about people who are friends and colleagues. Uh, it will be a painful process and a sad process for all of us, the task that we, uh, we face on Monday. But all of us must do what we think is right, and others must leave us alone to do so. I concur with the, with the Honourable uh, Lady. Um, the, the Honourable Lady, understandably, has uh, focused on wrongs and gongs, if I may say so, um, but she will know uh, that this government has not been distracted from its duties, uh, and she mentions the cost of living. I know how stressful and frightening and exhausting uh, that uh, living from hand to mouth can, can be, and we are determined to support families and businesses through these tough and volatile times. Global economic conditions have been made worse by the actions of those who would do us harm. The latest atrocity in Ukraine will have knock-on effects globally. And as a country, we must, and we will, weather this storm. That is why we are supporting households, on average, to the tune of uh, £3,300. It's why we have frozen fuel duty for the 13th consecutive year, why we have the triple lock, why we've had the largest ever increase to the national living wage, why we've doubled the personal allowance, why we are capping bus fares, and why we have introduced tax-free childcare supporting two million families and are expanding that offer further still. And the public needs a plan uh, from their government to grow the economy, to halve inflation and reduce debt. That's their priorities, and it's why it is our Prime Minister's priority too. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Lady will know that we are a resilient nation. We have had the fastest growing cumulative growth in, in the G7 for the last two years. The IMF have revised their forecasts up, and we have avoided a technical recession, which many said was inescapable. And this week we learn that employment is higher than pre-pandemic levels. We've got four million people into work, half of which are women, and women in high-skilled jobs is up 38.5% uh, since her party were in power. In tough times, this country doesn't need doom-mongers and hand-bringers. It needs fighters, it needs grafters, and it needs hope-bringers. It needs a government that will back families and workers and wealth creators and all who invest in every sense in our nation. And that's what we are focused on, most notably during uh, Tech Week on the growth sector of AI. In contrast, we know what Labour's AI policy is, anti-investment, anti-infrastructure, anti-innovation and anti-individuals. In 13 years of Labour, they managed to electrify just 63 miles of rail, tra of rail track. Their worst top 10 
IT failures cost half the school budget. They had no free childcare for under threes. They gifted us the fuel duty escalator and thought it acceptable state of affairs that someone with a second job got to keep only 2p for every additional pound they earned. No Labour government has ever left office with more people in work than when it came to power. AI isn't a danger to jobs and wages. A Labour government certainly is. Yeah.